Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is a very special episode with uh, three great guests, which is a new one for the podcast. Uh, it's all about Orange County drums and percussion. It's part two. The first one was great with Michael Kelly, but today we are joined back again by Jared Fallon, who is big OCDP restorer, fan, buff on everything OCDP. We have Corey Mansky, who was a um, builder from 01 to 04, and we have Nick Turner, who was a builder from 2000 to 2003. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. This is awesome, guys. I mean, Orange County, if people didn't hear the first episode, I recommend it. That one covers like the history of the company, a lot of just, you know, I don't want to say basic details, but it really goes into that, that everything you'd want to know about the origins of the company. And Jared actually posted something on social media asking for uh, questions that we might have missed, which you guys uh, had a lot of questions that you wanted to hear from us um, on this very, very popular episode. So um, I've asked Jared to kind of co-host this with me, and he is going to help uh, drive this episode a little bit and uh, and kind of queue up some questions for our builders from Orange County here. So Jared, why don't you take it away and um, kind of let us know what people wanted to know that we missed in the first episode. Yeah, let's uh, let's dive in. Um I guess we'll just start with uh, Nick, and then Corey can follow. Uh, when and how did you start? Um, so I started working at the shop in two. It was like late two thousand. Um, I graduated high school in early two thousand. I moved to San Diego, and I was already like very aware of the brand. Like all my favorite bands, I would read the liner notes and their CDs. Everybody was thanking Daniel and John at Orange County, and I was like. I love the way those drums sound. Like I need, I need to get in there. I need to figure out some more. I, I was a little punk kid from a small town in Arizona. I couldn't afford them, but I was like, I need to get close to this. So I moved to San Diego and I started like going to the shop on Saturdays. It was about an hour and a half drive for me. And I took like the first time I went, I took my Tama rock star rack Tom in. And I was like, can you guys re edge this for me? And like, I met John, I met Steve and they're like, oh, yeah. And, you know, John took my my rack tom in the back and, like, edged it. And uh, I ended up, they ended up doing the whole kit for me. And uh, the band I was playing at the time, I ended up moving to Orange County and I needed a job. And I was just in there on a Saturday, like, hanging out. And I was like, you guys ever hiring? And John's like, well, yeah, you know, can you hold a palm sander? You know, can you do this? Like, <laughs> yeah, 100%. And he's like, all right, show up on show up on Monday you know, at, uh, at 10, 10 a.m. or whatever. It was like, it was like kind of like banker's hours. So I came in at 10 o'clock and the first thing was they had a, they had a kit all packed up and I'm certain I, the reason I got the job, I had a pickup truck and they're like, <laughs> we have to, we have this drum kit. We have to deliver to West coast drum today. And it was like an eight piece. I remember it was like, it was this, uh, badass stained green with a high gloss on it. And it was like eight through 16 toms. And I forgot the eight inch Tom at the shop, my first job. <laughs> I went, I went all, <laughs> you had one job. I, nice. went, I went all the way to West Coast Drum. I dropped it off and like got back. And like John was just standing there with the box. And he's like, <laughs> you need to go back to West Coast Drum Center. Like you forgot this. And so I'm pretty sure that, like I said, the reason they hired me is I had a pickup truck. Um, it saved like, you know, like someone else like doing two or three trips at the time. But I was in there and it was kind of a thing of like, yeah, you know, if this works out, you know, if you're, if you're not an idiot and that was kind of how they told me, like, if you're not an idiot and you don't screw things up really badly, like, you know, let's see how it works out. We'll hire you. And that was in 2000 and, um, they, yeah, they, they never, they didn't never let me go. I mean, I, I ended up, I had, I left on my own terms, you know, later, later date, but, um, that was my start with the company. That's awesome. Jared, before we move on to Corey, can you remind people like, what was like the heyday of like when Orange County was the most popular drum brand in America, in the world? You know what I mean? What, what air, what yeah, dates I was, would you put uh, that I was just about to say, I think Nick would probably be uh, what I would say would be the height. Cause if I just look at when, um, Blink-182 came out with Enema of the State, not that there weren't big records before that, but I think really when Blink-182 came out with Enema, it kind of just blew up. So I, I remember as a kid, writing an email going like, Hey, I want what Travis wants, like everybody else. Uh, how long would it take? And the answer was, yeah, two years, uh, something like crazy like that. I would say that would be the height right there. Like crazy, two, uh, 99 to like at least 2002 
I don't think anybody was pumping out or making drums or in demand like Orange County was. Wild. Man, good time to be there. What about you, Corey? When, uh, how'd you get your start? Well, um, so I moved to California in uh, October of 2001, um, but I knew that I needed a job. Uh, I was living in Arizona at the time, and uh, we had come out to Arizona, or we had come out to California to kind of, you know, hey, where should we live kind of thing. And um, randomly, I had run into Josh Lamb at the NAMM show. He was wearing an Orange County shirt. And I, you know, like Nick, I knew about Orange County because I loved 311. And, you know, um, anyway, I was obviously very familiar with Orange County because every drummer in 2001 was very aware of Orange County drum. And, uh, and I just called randomly and I was just like, you know, hey, are you guys hiring? Kind of like Nick said, you know, hey, are you guys hiring? And I spoke to John on the phone and I literally called that number like off of like the business card that I randomly got from, from Josh, like at, at the NAMM show anyways. And, um, and in my former life, uh, I was a, a video editor in TV news in Arizona. And so, um, you know, the only thing I really knew <laughs> to do <laughs> was when you go to a job interview, you wear a suit. So, um, <laughs> so I didn't live in California yet. Um, I knew that, you know, I knew that I was about to move, right? And I knew that I wanted to have a job when I got here. And so uh, I literally drove to the shop in Santa Ana in a suit and uh, I got out of the car and walked in. And I think like John, we got our wires crossed about what time I like the, you know, the interview was supposed to take place. And I, I missed him by like a half an hour. <laughs> so I think that's right. And so like I literally yeah. stood <laughs> In the lobby, like, you know, like a pallbearer, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, stand right, totally standing in the lobby in a suit. And the crazy thing is, is like, you know, through the, I mean, I'm standing next to Travis's kit, right? And because it was up on that riser, uh, right in the lobby there. And I'm like looking, it was awesome. There was two snare racks or three snare racks in the lobby. And I'm like looking at the snare drums, but like after 10 minutes, like that got really old. Cause I was just standing there. Right. And, uh, so I kind of like, I remember I would sort of like look into the shop sort of like periodically, you know, cause I was just like, you know, <laughs> I think in my brain, I thought that, you know, I thought that place was going to be like the size of a Walmart and it wasn't, you know, I was just like, I was like, <laughs> what? This is like a storage unit. Um, and so like, I, I remember like seeing a couple of guys in there and of course everybody's, you know, in, you know, shorts and t-shirts and sawdust head to toe and the whole nine yards. And Nick, I'm pretty sure like you were the one, like, if not the only, definitely the first person to like come up to me and be like, Hey, Hey bro. Like, like you want to like come in here okay? and like, sit down or do you, like, you want, you want to drink a water or something, <laughs> you know? And I, you know, and they were all looking at me like I was there from like the IRS to audit the place or something. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we thought we were all going to jail when Corey showed up. Like it was, yeah, yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> so I, I did have an interview and, and I think even John, you know, now knowing John, <clears throat> I guarantee that like when he saw me, in uh, when he saw me in a in a suit, I'm sure he was just like, "What in the heck is happening?" Like, and yeah, got a job. So yeah, crazy. Yeah, as he showed up in his the the shorts that everybody knows as John's shorts, and the always sleeveless T-shirt was like his. On a nice day, he would tuck his T-shirt into his super short shorts. <laughs> that was shop formal. If John had his shirt tucked in, you knew that it was a formal day. <laughs> Man, but you weren't wrong to like, I mean, I feel like, you know, to show up to a job interview in a suit, there's like, you know, on paper you were right, but it's just like, you know, you don't know unless you know, right? Unless you show up and see what <laughs> it made for a good story. A hundred percent. I think it kind of like from maybe Bart and I perspective from like uh, looking at the website and what you, you see some of these artists like Travis and all these guys playing the kits, you would never think it is just a handful of guys in a small shop, just like walking around in shorts, making your nope. drums. You would never, ever you know? expect that and at I, all. I felt like the pedigree of what the company was at at that time, I would never have guessed it's just like, oh, okay, you can talk and walk. All right, you're hired. For sure. I wonder if it's a little bit of like, if people think that it's so prestigious, they don't even bother to reach out. I mean, it honestly kind of took yeah, you guys sure. some guts to like reach out and try and sign up for a job. At the time, I mean, in full honesty, like I moved to California with the objective of like, I was I was such a huge fan of Travis at that point, just like of his playing. It was the first time I'd ever heard 
the sounds that his drums made and then like the way that he played when I moved to California, it was a goal that I like set for myself of like, I'm going to move to California and I'm going to meet Travis Barker through like meeting or the guys at orange County kind of like how it started was like, I asked about uh, Adrian young giving lessons. I saw no doubt. And I'm like, does he give lessons or, you know, and like someone there told me like, Oh, he doesn't even know what he plays. Like he could never teach it to someone else, but they're like, Travis Barker gives lessons. <laughs> And so, I mean, like two of my huge, like my biggest goals, I mean, I'm 40 years old. This was, I was 17 years old at the time. Two of my biggest goals, meeting Travis. And then like, I actually took lessons with Travis at the time when I worked there. By the time I was 18 years old, and it was a thing of like, at the time I was like, oh, this is rad. Now that I'm 40 and I look back on it, I'm like, that was something, that was something that I did. I used to write checks to Travis Barker that I'm not even sure that he ever cashed, you know, like it was, <laughs> and it was, and, Man, and I the, didn't connection, know. the connection was Orange County. And that's, that's, I didn't 100%. know he taught lessons. That's crazy. I've never heard that. Yeah. I know for facts, I, it blew my mind. Like, um, Alon Rubin, you think now angels and airwaves, nine inch nails at the time, I want to say it was, um, FedEx TX maybe, or, um, I know a couple other bands, but he took lessons from Travis. And I think Alon was one of the earlier, younger guys to be endorsed oh, by yeah. Orange County. Yeah. So I thought, I thought that, that was mind blowing. I'm like, wait, Travis plays in all these bands is like a megastar, but is still giving out lessons. Travis, so. Travis was charging me $40 for an hour. And I was taking lessons at the same time as Alon. And like literally the, the famous stars and straps warehouse, um, he was teaching lessons out of there. He just had a drum kit set up in an office and like, I would walk in like dude before me to walk out. He's like, yeah, dude, see you next week. Like later. And I would literally write a $40. Ch- and I mean, at the point that they were the biggest thing on MTV at that point, it was, wow, it was insane. And literally the connection was orange County. And that's, that's crazy. hundred percent, you know? Yeah. Unbelievable was, I mean, so he was a good teacher. Oh, the thing is, is that I had, I had people like back in the day that were like when, once I learned Travis's background, like his, like all the rudiments and stuff, like his marching background, I had guys that didn't like Blink-182 that I would take to see Travis play. And they're like, what the hell? Like one, one friend, this always stuck out to me. He said, Travis is a robot built by the government to make all other drummers feel inadequate. And I mean, <laughs> the dude was, the dude was, a he was a badass. Like, I mean, he would do like, uh, like his snares would come back with like a hitting pattern like this. And you can literally pour milk into where his hitting pattern was and it would hold liquid. Like, wow. It was gnarly. It was in, insane. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Dude, Crazy. He's, and he's only gotten better. Yeah. Right. So like run us through what it would be like, uh, if say if any of us came through back in 2001 or 2002. I think it was always, you know, one of my favorite parts about working there, I think, was it was always a curveball. You, I, I think that none of us, none of us ever knew what to expect. Like, you know, we, you know, to answer your question about like day to day, it's like Nick kind of touched on it already. Like we show up and, you know, we'd all, there was work orders everywhere and all of us just sort of grabbed a work order and kind of went to town. And, you know, you had your, you know, your people who were, edging drums you had your people who were sanding drums you had your people that were sanding vents you had your people who were spraying the insides of the drums you had your people who were wrapping the drums i I said a long time ago that you know we were we were like a family like we were like brothers we were like a gang you know and you know i I would say that that translated like you know when we were at nam and stuff like at the booth like it was us against the world and it really felt like that and um just on a quick side note like it's it's no surprise to me that like, you know, there's like 15 of us that like, you know, we keep in touch. I mean, we all, we could all reach out to any of us and immediately just be like, it's like right there. So, but I think like the day to day, again, you know, there were work orders everywhere and and things were already at, at, at a certain stage of completion. And we knew that we needed to dive in and we typically knew when that was like due by and who it was going to blah, blah, blah. But then I think, you know, every once in a while, you know, you'd pull an order and you'd look at the, t- the name on the top and you'd be like, who, you know, and, or, you know, somebody would come around the corner and they'd say, uh, such and such and so-and-so is coming to pick up their drums today. And you're just like, really? Like, you know, Ray Luzier <laughs> walks in, Lou Dog walks in, Gil Sharon walks in. I mean, like, 
It was <laughs> it, it was like the hitters, it. man. Yeah, and and it's funny because and Nick will back me up on this. For those of us that really needed the money, and I was one of those people, um, there was an option to work Saturdays. So I worked mon- Monday through Friday, and then I came in on Saturdays. And you know, Saturdays were that was actually the sweet spot because that's when like Lou Dog would like roll in there at noon and and literally like I like he would bring like ten pizzas and like we would. You know, we're all just sitting around like building screws and like sanding and like, you know, some people may have smoked some stuff and um and and then, you know, <laughs> eating pizza like it was like that was crazy to me. Awesome. <laughs> it's like heaven. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you guys like it sounds like you guys had this like we're like you said, we're all in this together, like sometimes with huge companies, you you kind of you can care less. I'm assuming working for a huge mega you know, a drum company, any company, you don't care as much because you're just kind of a cog, you know, or you're just one of, but you guys seem like really a family dude, where everyone, dude, like we all absolutely cared so much about what we were doing and what we were making with all the employees that worked there. There was never like a dude that was like an outcast or like, Oh, this guy, we just, let's put him in the corner and like, he can polish screw, like bad screws all day. Like we were like Corey said, like it was like we like like we went to Nam show, like we were like a gang. Like we all we rode together. It was do or die. I mean, we all wanted we knew what we were putting it. I mean, I think that we kind of knew what we were putting out. We didn't understand the full impact, like the, what it would be today. But yeah. everyone that worked there, we all we all had each other's back and there was never like a dude, like I said, like, oh, this is the scrub that like he works in the closet or like, you know, whatever. It was very much um, like all for one and one for all. Like we're all we're all doing this, and we we kind of had an idea, you know, of what we were doing at that point. Now, except Corey did show up every day in his suit, though, yeah. for the rest of his time there. Right? That was that was weird. For, yeah, I always, I always refer to that as like I I called it bring your Corey to work day because by the time by the time John showed up. Like I had like started talking to Corey and like we both found out, like he said, he moved from Arizona. I grew up in Arizona and he worked on like the news broadcast that I watched as a child. And there was a newscaster who was like super hot, Terry Hitchcock. <laughs> and so like me and Corey bonded over that. And so by the time he got like hired on, it was like, dude, I'm like, bro, like remember that day you sat in the back of the shop and like, we just talked about Tara Hitchcock until John showed up for your interview. Like, and I like, was just <laughs> that right there. What other company, like no other company has something like that or just no. that vibe where you can do not, that. I mean, no. I guess like moving on in regards to the drums. So like you said, everybody really cared about what they were doing and really put in the effort. And I mean, the drums speak for themselves, but in regards to that, you know, were you allowed to build your own drums? And if so, what did you guys build? Yeah, so I don't know if your recollection of this is the same as mine, Nick, but um, John was always super cool about letting us build stuff. And I would say that we got like a a discount. Lots of the times he would say, you know, come in on a Saturday when it isn't a full crew and we aren't working on, you know, all the stuff to pay the bills. And, you know, he would say like... uh, you know, obviously the, the labor is free. Like if you, if you were to, you know, buy your homies lunch, they're like, they'll work on your drums and blah, blah, blah. You just pay me for parts. I, that, that's what I seem to remember. And like, I, like, just like Nick, like I couldn't afford Orange County drums when I moved to California. Um, and I was a Pearl guy when I moved to California. Um, and one of the things that I did quickly, like soon after I started there was I rewrapped uh, my big pearl kit and I'll never forget that weekend. Like I'll never forget coming in on the weekend and like, it was exciting to like pull it all apart and like, ha- you know, have, you know, somebody re edge it and like, and it's funny, I still have that kit and I'll never sell it. Um, because it has those magic, the orange County, the, uh, the ply of flatness and the bearing edges. And it's the real authentic crushed, um, glass sparkle and it's purple yeah. Oh, yeah. and it's dope. And I'll just never get beautiful it. kit. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, I did um, get to the point where I purchased. Um, I purchased two snare drums, and I paid for parts on another snare drum because um, while someone <clears throat> Dean was um, filing the snare bed, 
he gouged he he gouged the outside of a thir- thirteen. I was a thirteen guy back then. Um, it was a seven by thirteen thirty ply with three vents, and it's uh, like a like a gray satin stain. So you can see the wood grain over the whole thing, and so. And he's and he's just going crazy on the snare bed, and he slipped, and so there was a gouge on the side. And since it was a stain, um, they, they they were like, ah, eh, whatever. They chucked it. So I pulled it out of the dumpster, and I <laughs> no, that's the truth. And I walked into John's office, and I was just like, hey, so somebody, Dean, <clears throat> um, scratched this thing, and uh, like, can I, if I if I buy the throw off and the hoops and the heads and the tube lugs, like, can I build it? He's just like, sure. So I did, and I still have that snare drum too. Oh, that's awesome, <laughs> Nick. Did you build anything? Or uh, I I I kind of know the answer, but uh, for viewers, <laughs> did you build anything? Right. Yeah, I mean, like honestly, at the time, um, I mean, being you know, I was as young as I was. I, I, I straight up couldn't afford, you know, Orange County at the time. So the first, the, the first thing that I did that was actually was, a, and it was a cool thing, you know, like how Corey was saying, like, do the labor on your time was like, we always had like, we called them abortions where like something would get messed up, like a, a file would slip and come down the side of something. Um, there was a floor Tom that was built, uh, built for some 41 that had a, a bad screw was drilled wrong in it. And that it got like put on the shelf, a rack Tom that was made for Adrian young kind of was the same thing. Um, I grabbed those two shells and put them together and I asked John, I was like, Hey man, like, you know, if I, if I fix these, you know, can I put them together? And he's like, yeah, you know, do the work, like pay for the parts, same thing. And then on the kick drum, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So we had these birch shells that used to sit up on top of our router room we cut two of them down and John like fused them together. We had this gnarly glue. I can't remember the name of it, but John like literally fused these two Burt shells. It was like a 14 and a 14. And then we cut it down to make it 20 inches deep. So it was a 22 by 20. Um, and then we wrapped it in like this gnarly gray fur. And I just paid for parts on that. The rest of the drums, I mean, they were going to get thrown away. And so that was the first kit that I had that was like orange County that like I built you know, my homies were there, Corey, whatever, you know, we all worked on it. Max was there. Max actually was one of the first dudes that, that played it the day that it was done. But it was all just kind of like the reject stuff that we put together. Um, but yeah, I mean, I honestly, at the time, I couldn't afford to just straight up be like, I want to build a gnarly 40 ply snare drum. It wasn't my like, I didn't get to build what I wanted to build, but I got to build stuff to say I was playing Orange County. And I mean, that was that was good enough for me at the time. It shows initiative that you guys would do that. I think any boss in any industry would be like, you want to come in and do what you're doing for work, but on your own time for yourself and get better at what you're doing. I mean, I think that's a pretty cool thing. It's It shows passion. It shows initiative. I think people, bosses would like that, you know, and, and you're, there's no waste. You're using stuff that was going to go, you know, get in the dumpster or something like yep. that. Right. Yeah. I think it also kind of segues to my next question. Um, like, how did you guys come up with some of these uh, designs, uh, whether it be for a customer or the NAM? And I think it kind of goes back to if you guys were just grabbing the rejects and building stuff for yourself, I'm sure a lot of ideas were maybe generated um, or somebody came up with something that had never been done before just on their own time. Um, maybe you could shed some light on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, for sure, a lot of it was like once we started doing, I mean, you know, by the time I came along, like, you know, powder coating was a big thing. And like a lot of other drum companies weren't doing that. A lot of ours was like, you know, like, okay, like what finish can I put with some powder coating that's going to be like different, whatever. And then once we started getting into like the crazy stuff of like, okay, we've done this, we've done powder coating, we've done everything we can do there. Like, that's when like Jeremy had the snare that he put like all the spikes on, like the one inch, like gnarlier than the Vinnie Paul snare. It had like <laughs> all the one inch, sp- like you literally couldn't play it because it would rip your legs apart. <laughs> <laughs> but like we started getting into, and like, I remember like you this was like when I first started, um, you know, knowing like Travis, like his love of Cadillacs, I had gone to a junkyard and got a bunch of like the Cadillac emblems like off the hoods of cars, you know, like they used to have the emblems that was on the wire on the top, like on the roof or the hood. I started trying to figure out a way, like I took one and drilled it and tapped it to one of our screws. And I'm like, Oh, look, if you put a 20 ply screw through the front of a kick drum hoop, you could mount the Cadillac emblem 
on the front of, you know, the kick drum. And I, I, I had some ideas that were a lot more crazy, like crazier than that. And Daniel at the time was like, dude, like, don't, don't let Travis see any of this or think, know that we're, you know, cause if we do this, he's going to want the next thing. But it was like stuff like that. Just like, Oh, we can mount. What if we mounted a Cadillac thing, you know, on the drum. And then like Jeremy was, I always felt Jeremy was like super Berman was super like innovative of like, Oh, let's take, like he built the one that he took a famous stars and straps belt buckle and like inlaid it into the side of a snare drum. So like the badges on one side, the belt buckle was laid in on the other side. And it was just, it was kind of like, what's the craziest thing that we can do? Like what's, what's something that no one else is going to come up with. And it was always like spitball ideas in like one out of every 10 would stick of like, okay, let's try that. That's a thing. That's something we think is going to and, and also like, I let's think that, I, I think that like, you know, back then the company's mantra was uh, our only limitation is your imagination. And that was like on the yep. catalog. And it's funny because yeah. I don't, I couldn't tell you who came up with that, but I can tell you that all of us absolutely bought into that. Like, you yeah. know, I mean everything. And, 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 you know, even I think when the company started to make good money, that also gave us other options. Like John started to be able to source, you know, other stuff to wrap drums in. And, and, you know, like we did a kit that was authentic um, Wilson tennis ball material, like from like, I'm not talking about like a knockoff, like stuff that emulates. I'm talking like he, you know, he had the buying power or whatever to like get a, a sheet of that, stuff like (laughs) you know and so and i mean you know obviously we we i mean you already said for nick but like we did the louis vuitton stuff we did leather we did cows hide like you name it and it's like we started to have access to stuff because a we had the buying power but b we had the imagination we just started to make crazy stuff and you also mentioned um jeremy and what a like he was always so innovative like you know, the, the volcano drum, which was, you know, a what was it like a 13 on the bottom and a 14 on the top stuff like that is, is, is insane. Like it's insane to build that stuff. And, and what I think is so crazy is, is that, that, that specific idea, we were all just like, what? Like, Oh, so you're going to build a 20 ply on the outside of the, and then, it, and then we wrapped it like in this walnut burnish and like had it like high gloss and it was dope. I mean, some of that stuff can look really kind of campy and junky and whatever. That thing was freaking amazing. We mentioned this in the first, uh, you know, the part one with with Mike Kelly and Jared. But like now you kind of take it for granted because SJC and there's all these other brands that and, that do this stuff over the years. But it wasn't happening then. No. It's just like looking at an industry at the very beginning of it, of like kind of custom boutique, unique crazy guys going in junkyards, people making wild drums. I mean, this was like seriously wild. I also think that like there are a lot of companies now and even maybe then like where that's all they did. See, the thing that I always thought Orange County, we we really could hang our hats on the fact that we were also making some really Mm -hmm. great, like, you know, no offense, like just drums, like the drums were killer. You know what I'm saying? And, yes. and, and and I'll say this, like I, the thing that blew my mind when I first started there was we had the big four when I started there. And the big okay. four is Travis, Adrian, John Otto from Limp Bizkit and Chad Sexton. Like that, in my opinion, I mean, those were like, the, the, those are the big four. I mean, at, you know, in 2001, there were no bigger bands on earth than those four bands. Somebody already said like the notoriety, everybody knew what Orange County was and it, you know, those drums sounded killer, you know, and this, you know, again, we had resources to materials and blah, blah, blah. And the spike drum that Nick was talking about, that was literally John asked, you know, came out into the shop and asked one day, like, Hey, does anybody have any crazy ideas for now? And, you know, when you, when you, when you say that to a group of guys and they're out there eating their lunch and covered in sawdust and, you know, listening to Finch on the record, you know, on the radio, like, <laughs> we all start chit chatting about like stuff and Nick's right. Like some of those ideas were dumb and boneheaded and whatever. And some actually like reached a certain point where you try it and it kind of didn't work. And I actually said to Jeremy, we were standing in the back of the shop, spraying the inside of the drums. He was training me how to do that. And I said, Hey, like those spikes that like people put on leather jackets. I'm like, what if we, uh, and he stopped spraying and he just sort of looked at me 
he goes, come on. And we set the drums down and we both walked into the office and John was like, just hanging up the phone. And Jeremy's just like, Mansky's got it. Like it's like, you know, those spikes, you think we can get those spikes and blah, blah, blah. And it was so funny because, uh, John goes, well, <laughs> John goes, well, how many, like how many spikes? All and, of them. Right. And, 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, and it's funny because I said, well, I said, how many of those can we get? And I, and, and I was just like, I was like, I don't know. It'd be kind of cool. And then Jeremy just totally <laughs> cut me off. He's like, he goes, the whole fucking thing. <laughs> Any that, available I was just like, and real that drum was, was literally like lug to lug <laughs> line. It was impossible to play it. Yep. And it, and and it, and it was and it was Jeremy. Jeremy was just like, let's let's wrap it in chrome first, and then do it. So it looked like Hellraiser. And and you guys might remember, like I I, I still talk about this because that drum, which kind of basically fell out of my brain in a conversation with Jeremy, like that was on the cover of the catalog for like five years yeah, or something. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's five years, but it was a long time. For the record, I've been searching for that drum high and low. <laughs> Somebody, ha if anybody's listening out there, please call me. Um, if anyone can find it, it'll be you, Jared. Yeah, yeah no I, doubt. Yeah. I, I, dude, I hope you find it. This episode is brought to you by Kelly Drums. Michael Kelly is one of the original builders slash designers from OCDP with over 30 years building experience, as well as being a drum and studio technician. Michael and I were trying to figure out a way to promote his new brand, and it just lined up perfectly to have him sponsor this Orange County episode. Kelly Drums is a brand new drum company specializing in hand-painted snare drums of a variety of species of wood, as well as metals and acrylics. All drums are 100% built and painted in-house in the USA, with a focus on thinner shells for more full tone and using a variety of re-ring options for more attack. Check out everything he has for sale at kellydrums.com. That's K-E-L-L-E-Y drums.com. And be sure to follow him online at Kelly Drums. That's K-E-L-L-E-Y drums. Speaking of the drums, um, you said it was all done tastefully. I do have to say, I always remember reading on the site and um, anybody I'd ever talked to would actually play them. It didn't matter what color somebody had chosen. It didn't matter how weird or gaudy it might have looked. They were always built to the highest standard, same quality of parts. I remember, I think on the site, it was like, everybody gets the same man hours, everybody's drum. The only thing that changes is just the price and the finish. Yep. So I always thought that that was cool. Yep. And Jared, I want to jump on that and say, because like, I think Jared, actually, you posted something on Facebook the other day that was like, it had some, it was like a satin finish green set and it was just green. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you were rewrapping it, but I was like, it took me a minute. It was kind of like, wait a minute. I don't think I've ever seen just like a nice, clean, no real, no frills Orange County kit. I'm sure I'd seen that. I'm sure you guys did a ton of them, but it, it was sort of like, it was like refreshing a little bit to like, cause you're used to seeing all these crazy finishes and stuff. But I was like, man, I kind of like that. I feel like sometimes when you order drums from a company like Orange County, you think to yourself, I gotta get something yeah. wild. Cause that's what these guys do. But it was beautiful. It was like, it's cool to see just like a plain finish you know, single color drum set, Agreed. you know, you don't see that too often. Yeah. You know, we had the dude that was like the old dude. Uh, is it Barry? Chanel. Barry Chanel. Yeah. He played with the gap band. He had wow. like a, an old school. It was a, not champagne, but it was like sand sparkle. That was just a the classic. Bermuda sand. Bermuda sand Bermuda sparkle. Sand. Just classic that Chrome hardware. And I mean, that was like, it was cool to see that once in a while and be able to see like, that to me is as classy as like any like DW kit. Yeah. But yeah. also we can do Louis Vuitton with spikes that'll cut your legs up and a bicycle, <laughs> a bicycle that you can ride out of here. Yeah. Nick, like think back to how many just basic classic snare drums and kits we made. I mean, that's the thing is that's the thing I think most people don't know. Like I, I would say um, one out of every five, either drums or kits that we made were, I mean, how many just basic flat black kits do we make? I get it that those are kind of Travis copies, but that's a classic kit. How many silver glass right. kits did we make? Right. Like, well, like we, we made a lot of that stuff. And, and, you know, the other thing when I was talking before about um, uh, resources, uh, being able to afford more things, we, through the years, we brought on new painters that specialized in different things. I mean, you know, right. we got to the point where we could, um, blow candy and high gloss over 
like beautiful wood grains. I mean, we made some really amazing. I think about the Chad Sexton yeah. kits that are all like the quilted maple that are like highlighter right. oh, blue, yeah. high gloss. Talk about classic. Right. Like, that's a beautiful yeah. kit. Well, even yeah. your your snare that you and I talked to Mike Kelly about this is like one of my favorite finishes. Yeah, the, the um, platinum actually, bird's just eye. told platinum bird's eye. That's I just the told green Jared, one Bart's referring to. Um, he had something he posted. Well, it's faded, yeah, but yeah, is the 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 platinum bird's eye. That was a, a just a super classy, just beautiful finish. That was the most simple thing that we could have done. That was all done in house, unless it was a high gloss. You know, went out to get sprayed, but yep. that was all. You know, Mike did Mike did a bunch of those. Yep. You know, when he worked there. So. Yep. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, what was the craziest one you guys remember? Whether it was for an artist or for a customer, one that just like sticks out in your head. I mean, I I would have to say honestly, and it's just because like a, my my personal connection to it was the first uh, three wheel low rider bike that we did for Lou Dog. Um, he had like kind of been piecing together like these weird Ludwig kits, and then he came to us. I think he'd like been doing snares or something, but he came to us with this whole concept. It was a Schwinn low rider bicycle, three wheel, like three wheel frame. The rack toms were mounted up on the handlebars. The snare drum was mounted on the front of the frame, like in front of the seat, the kick drum, the rack or the kick drum, the floor tom, then, you know, symbols sat on the other side, but it was this crazy, like airbrushed, like ghost, like ghost flame kind of stuff where like under a certain light, it was just this badass green color and then under certain light you would hit like ghost flame stuff and uh lou dog let me like his thing is like he wanted to see it once it was all done he brought the bike in we had the drums done we assembled it all and he wanted to see it from afar like he didn't want to be like on it like too close to the project so he's like hey man you gotta ride this thing out to my car <laughs> and i was like <laughs> i'm like first of all this is like a uh, probably a five thousand dollar lowrider bicycle that you've brought to us, and we've just bolted probably another six thousand dollars worth of drums to it. Like I do not want to be. Res-. He's like, you got to ride it. You have to ride the bicycle. And like, okay, dude. <laughs> so he's got like his his ninety seven Ford Expedition parked out back, and I jump on his bicycle and I'm like, oh my like i don't want to do this and i've never seen someone so excited and that by i mean that thing like we went and saw them at house of blues that night and everyone like was so pumped on the bike so pumped on the finish like just the, it was it was an amazing kid it was like kind of seeing like his crazy vision and our crazy vision collide uh that that one sticks in my mind is like one of my favorite just like is this real life like is this did we just do this we just bolted bicycle. That's uh, we crazy. Bolted drums to a bike, and now they're on stage. And the thing bounced; it was on springs. <laughs> so when he played it, the whole That's bike. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it was so good. All right, I got two crazies, two crazy kids. Uh, I can't make up my mind. Um, you know, at one point, uh, not only did we have other resources or additional resources for materials and stuff, but so did the artists. And like, I mean, Travis is obviously the, you know, ultimate in that regard. But, um, d- dude, when we started to get into uh, acrylic drums that were candied on the inside with lighting fixtures, I want to say that Orange County was for sure the first company to put lighting fixtures inside drums and make them triggerable and stuff like that. Um, and, and it's funny because the first lighted kit, was for John Otto was a huge failure and it sat in the office forever because it was, um, the strobes inside were from, uh, the, their runway lights. Like that's how bright they are, but they were so sensitive that all the bass frequencies were like, we're setting them off and John hated it. So, so anyway, the crazy kit though, um, he, this is on the cover. He's sitting on the cover of modern drummer with this kit and they did part of the photo shoot for this kit in the office at orange County. And Yeti was, um, was his tech at the time and me and yeti cleaned the kit when it was done it's the family tree logo so it's the blue acrylic kit that lights up from the inside and his kit is massive right so the thing that made it unique was it was blue candy and sandblasted on the inside so it was frosted candy blue and the the family um tree logo is like those three circles like with the trunk that's like their logo right and that was put on before they were sandblasted. Then 
it was painted, then that was taken off. So it's like the, 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 the drums are blue, but then that tree glows white out on the outside of every single one of the drums. And that's the drum set that he's just chilling like in modern drummer with. And the best part was, is that his budget was so gnarly that he goes, um, he just said it really simply. He goes, I need, and then I need a replica of this for Europe, but just make it, but, but just make it the inverse is what he said. So, and, and by the way, I, I have pictures of that kit because the inverse that, it, that they sent to Europe is all clear with blue candy hardware and the blue candy tree logo on the thing. It's gnarly. So that, wow. that was a crazy kit. And like putting that thing together was amazing. Cause that thing was amazing. And then my second crazy kit, this will go right back to, to Nick because it's a, a story about his favorite dude ever. Um, I was walking to the bathroom and if you're walking toward the bathroom, the phone was like on your way, like up to getting into the front of the, Right. And the phone was just ringing as I was walking by and I, I picked it up. I, we always all did that. Whatever. The phone was always ringing off the damn hook. So I'm walking up, phone rings, I pick it up and it's Travis. And at the time he was married to, you know where I'm going with this, Nick. At the time he was married to um, the playmate. mate. Shana. What was her name? Was it Shana? Yeah, Shana. Shana. And that. so yeah. he had a kit that was all of her centerfolds all over the drums and then they blew a uh, high gloss over the whole thing. And we were literally working on that kit right then. Like, so anyway, so I pick up the phone, it's Travis, and he's literally calling to check on the status of that kit. And I had met Travis before, but I had never spoken to him on the phone before. And so he starts to ask me about the status of the kit. And I froze because I didn't want to say, we, I just drilled her. I just screwed her. I just <laughs> polished her. I just, because that's what we were doing. Like we were hands on, like making this thing, you know, and it felt crazy that we were all looking at these drums going, God, she's hot or whatever. And I'm the guy that draws the short straw, picks up the phone and it's Travis on the phone asking how the kid is coming along. And I just like a deer in headlights. I just stood there like, you have got to be kidding. Me. Like, yeah, it was. I didn't look at her, dude. Yeah, right. Yeah, I didn't look at her except for when I was drilling the badges like through her nipples. Like, um, sorry, dude. Like, I just touched like, your uh, wife. Like, I didn't know what to say. Yeah, that's let awesome. Me, let me get John for you. Yeah. Uh, one second. All right. Um, thanks for that story, Corey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, thirteen-year-old me probably would have been in heaven at that point. Um, yeah. So another question that uh, a lot of people, including myself, have like kind of wondered over the years. I know maybe not the first, but it really kind of felt that way that the when did the acrylic and the hybrids of like metal and wood or wood and acrylic really start to like come into play? Because I remember just seeing that and it just going, wow, what is that? I think a lot of that goes back to Jeremy again. I think that it's just him being innovative. And I think that Again, once we had resources, we were you know starting to get into the acrylic land, like I just mentioned a second ago. It's like it was natural for us to be like, "Oh, you got some chocolate in your peanut butter." You know what I mean? It was natural for us to be like, <laughs> Mix, yeah. "What if?" Mix them up. Yeah, I remember the very first, um, and I don't. Jared would probably know better because I didn't pay attention to this stuff back then. But it was like basically the equivalent of like the twenty ply that we got and it was like from the, the company that supposedly made like Shamu's tank. We got the 14 inch shell that was like, it was the equivalent of yep. a 20 ply, like it was the an acrylic inch shell. Thing, yeah. And so like, I remember the first one of those that came in and like, we figured out like we got it vented and we got the edges cut on it. And like, I remember like specifically, like I got to sand the edge on it. The smell. And as I was going through, I was going through this, the smell first off, but I remember going through like the, you know, the grades of sandpaper going, you know, 220 and then we take it down to 400. And I remember being like, you know, if I hit this with 800, we can make this, the edge on this thing is going to be, you won't even be able to tell where it's cut. It's going to be like, like a diamond. It's just going to be beautiful. And we sanded that thing down. I think it's probably like, I would say like 800 or even more. More, I am Maybe sure. hit it with some steel wool. And then like polished it. And like, that was the very first shell that we got. And that might've gone to Travis or, you know, it was probably, 
you know, being it was the first one, it probably went, you know, to Travis or someone, you know, on his caliber at the time. But that was just thing of like seeing that for the first time of like, this is something that I've literally never seen. I've seen the Vista lights and you've seen the seams in them. Yep. That was the first time of seeing something completely just like, this is the first one of its kind. Yep. Yeah. And we're doing this. Like my hands are on this drum and people are going to see this and freak out. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, the whole thing kind of makes me think too, like, like in an alternate universe, this would be like an awesome like TV show, like a reality TV show. And I'm not talking like, you know, a lame one, but I'm talking like a like like almost like a cool car show or like Orange County Choppers back in the day or something where it's like dudes in the shop doing crazy stuff. It would have been awesome. Wasn't that actually pitched to John and he said no? I'm pretty sure that I, sounds like John. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I read in like yeah. High Times back in the day that he was the it was pitched to him from like Discovery Channel and he said, Yeah, no, we're good. Um I'm almost I, positive. I wouldn't doubt that. It would have been Discovery Channel. I'm almost positive right. that I read that. Yeah. Um interesting. As far as that goes, had that ever come to fruition? I mean, one thing I was just thinking, like, oh, I was getting ready to do this, I was like, one of the craziest thing is like we didn't have cell phone cameras back then. We didn't have I literally have no pictures of the time that I worked there. I have pictures of like myself with the drums outside of the shop, but I don't have, there's the, the, the CD ROM or DVD ROM, whatever that they put out that Corey and I are both in. But like outside of that, I don't have pictures of us working there, but I mean the the day to day, it would have been freaking hilarious. We did, we had tape ball fights. I mean, we had just like, trying to figure out who's going to lunch, who's driving to lunch, like just the, the in and outs of of working there would have made an amazing TV show. I totally agree. Its own. Yeah. But it, I mean, it's kind of the Bonham effect or like Keith Moon where like there's this mystique of like, we don't have photos or that many. We, we have a lot of videos and photos right. of those guys, but we don't have day to day every, it kind of takes a little bit away from it. It would have been awesome. Yeah. But like, there's something cool about like just hearing these stories from you guys is like our, you know, the oral history of it, as opposed to like, all right, I'm sick of these guys. Click next channel. Right. You know what I mean? Even if yeah. as cool as it is, we all still, yeah. You know, it's just it makes it kind of special that it wasn't recorded right. every day. Oh, yeah. Well, I think no, for this sure. kind of goes back. So uh, Corey mentioned earlier Josh Lamb. If I'm not mistaken, he was the guy who was kind of doing like the, um, like the the pictures and the the web stuff, right? Yeah, he was, and John was. Like it actually did get to a certain point. I don't know who tipped the scale here and I don't know who eventually got into John's ear regarding, you know, whether it was website stuff or promotional stuff. But like, I think that I I think I I remember the popularity of the catalog really, you know, because, you know, like to, to, to Nick's point, we didn't have cell phone camera. Like there wasn't Twitter. I mean, there was, but like that stuff was in its infancy. infancy. So like, yeah, right. So, so the catalog was, a commodity like the, there were people i mean how many people came to the nam booth today? can i just get a catalog dude there was hundreds of those people every single day so i think that it got to a point where um john you know he just went out and bought a really nice camera and it's funny a lot of the pictures that you see in the catalogs and stuff dude those were shot in the back parking lot in the sunlight like that's the truth yeah well, like what I was getting at is like, I mean, you, a lot of it was undocumented because the internet was so in its infancy right. and um, I'm sure a lot of it was like, hey, let's just get this shipped out or whatever the case may be. But you also said you did a lot of modest, tons of classic and modest builds, but I'm sure a lot of those just never saw um, a catalog. So when you, I, right. a lot of people think Orange County, they think what they saw in the catalog or the NAMM show, like to this day, I'll see something pop up on whether it be eBay or Reverb, and you go, oh, well, where did that come from? Or hiding in a rock. Like, there's a lot yeah. that is still mis- like the mystique about it of we don't know what's out there. I think that went back to that uh, the question in the first podcast was like, how many of these things were made because they weren't serialized? Do you actually right. like right. have an, a number for that? Man, I, I, like, I, guess, I wouldn't know where to begin. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I, 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 all I have to say is the entire time I worked there in a three ring binder, we had an order book for snare drums and an order book for kits. And those were single page in a in one of those like laminated sleeve. Those three ring binders were like as thick as an old phone book or like a dictionary. And the, the snare drum one was always that thick. And the kit one was always that thick. So I mean, 
God, I, 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 I don't know. The number of drums that were cranked out, you know, I mean, 600 just for Travis. Like, like it's, it's a lot. I'm kidding about the 600, but yeah, it's, but, but I mean, it's a lot. Um, real quick, funny story that you say that, um, uh, to deviate from this a little bit, there was a guy I had met through eBay years ago named Rick Caro, who was friends with, uh, John's brother. I believe it was Joe Machada. Mm-hmm. And he had mm-hmm. like a Honda when he used to do boats and used to paint. He went dumpster diving the day that Orange County closed. Cause a lot of things were thrown in the dumpster. So I bought a lot of, you know, parts and things like that. He asked if I wanted binders with papers, and I said no. Ah, uh, I want to say that that would probably I'm that now kicking you myself a... right now, thinking that that probably held the answer to. Yeah, that, that was the holy grail, dude. Uh, I but did not like know that now. you, Jared, <laughs> I mean that's a part of the history now, though, which is crazy. Is like of like that story is a part of Orange County history of like not getting that binder because it's just like I'm sure that happened with Slingerland or oh, we threw that away. You know, it's like. Sure. Or it's now we know I have something now we know uh, the guy who blew it. Yeah, right. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Um, Or also like Mike has been (laughs) hounding me for it. I just haven't had the time. I have a storage toad that I also got from him that has all the cutouts of the vents with all of the finishes. Oh, yeah. And literally Mike was like, if you go through them, I could tell you, you probably have stuff from Travis's drum, Chad's drum. Yep. Basically, every time they cut a vent. I have all those plugs. I just have to go through them. And uh, I guess to kind of like drive it home from here, um, when you guys were there or after you left, did you really know the impact of the brand or what you guys had done or built or that people would still be talking about it today or that it would still be around, anything like that? I mean, for me now, like I said, I, I just turned 40. And so like looking back on like, I started working there when I was 17 like I knew that there was something like when we went places, like people moved out of the way, like the NAM show, we were the, I mean, which we used to have like beer in our booth and like the no Dickies uh, outfits, right? We had, yeah, <laughs> we had the, the button down Dickies shirts with embroidered logo on it, all that. I mean, we, we knew back, I mean, I, I understood back then that there was something with that brand that drew people. And like, we were like the hot, you know, at the time we were the hot commodity. And just kind of, you know, being a kid and being uh, just trying to figure out life, like I probably some of that got lost on me. And then it was almost like an immediate, as soon as I wasn't working there anymore, I kind of like realized like, oh crap, that was like, that was my, my once in a lifetime, like job. That was my, I mean, the people that I met, we had lunch with, you know, like Corey said, like Travis calling on the phone. Adrian coming in for lunch and like playing us the new No Doubt record before anybody had heard it. Just all the the crazy stuff that we had access to that nobody else did. Kind of as soon as I wasn't there anymore. And I mean, I had a good relationship with them up until like the Guitar Center thing. Like I had, I took one of the the first prototype Guitar Center kits out on tour uh, that John gave me. Pretty much as soon as I left, I kind of realized like the full scope of what that was but i've never appreciated it more than i do now of like being an older an older person and and knowing kind of how life works and understanding that you know companies like that like that was you know you could put orange county next to dw or or next to pork pie or any of these companies that have been around like bill dedimore's story that you did was great i love that i love i love hearing that and and kind of like being able to parallel you know, what I did or where I worked at the time next to those companies. I definitely appreciate it way more now, but at the time that I was there working, as crazy as it was, it was it was my means to pay my rent and to, you know, keep food in my mouth. But there was also a sense of like, we're a gang, we're a family, we're, we're doing something that no one else is doing. And it, this is badass. And so. Yeah, I'll, that's awesome. Uh, so I'll piggyback on to Nick's answer and I'll just say, um, you know, Nick and I are really similar in the sense that when we began working there, we already knew that it was a big deal. So I think the real word, the real phrase here is is lasting deep impact. You know what I mean? Like, that's the part that I think was really hard to judge then. You know, it's like, 
some, you know, I heard somebody say one time, like, oh, a drum company is only as good as its artist roster. And I remember like, la- like belly laughing when I heard that. Cause at the time working at Orange County, I was like, who's got a better roster than Orange County? Are we, you joking? Like we had the best roster. Right. And so like, so when I heard that and when I thought about that back then, I felt like, okay, well, if we're only as good as our artist roster, and if that's the thing that's creating like that deep, you know, impact, it's like, you know, you got to think like Ludwig has made tons of Bonham copy kits, right? And if there's been, you know, tons of, uh, you know, Ringo copy kits made, you know, for sure. Like the time that we worked at Orange County Drum, you know how many Travis copy kits we made? And here's the thing, the crazy part about Travis is how many kits is Travis famous for? Like seven or eight different kits, you know, the yellow yeah. with the stars and the red, white, and blue. And the, like, right. And it's like, we made a zillion copies of every single one of those. And so like, if you want to talk about, you know, deep, long lasting impact, it, I mean, you, you, you don't have to look any further than how many copycat kits we built. But to, to tell you the truth, I knew that we had something special, but like Nick, like there's a couple of moments where you really recognize that you have something special. And like, you know, I would say I have two of those moments. The first moment is like, uh, um, at NAM. my second, my second NAM with Orange County, uh, Travis came and it was a Saturday and it was a day where he was going around to like, he would go, he went to like Remo and he was mobbed and he went to Zildjian and he was mobbed and blah, blah, blah. And he got to the Orange County booth. And I do have pictures of this. He got to the Orange County booth. And, you know, like all of the walkways were totally clogged. There was hundreds of people there and it was at the end of the day. Well, if you've ever been to the NAMM show about a half hour before the show closes, there's an announcement over the PA that says, you know, hi, you know, attention NAMM showgoers, the convention mm-hmm. center showroom floor closes in 30 minutes and please make your way to the exits and blah, 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 blah. And like none of us at Orange County or Travis or any of those 300 people moved a muscle. Like, because, <laughs> because here's what we knew. We knew that all of the rules did not apply to us. They didn't. He's Travis. He's, that's Travis. Like, we're Orange County. Like, go ahead and shut the lights off, bro. Like, we're all here. <laughs> we're not, none of us not are really. going anywhere. It was, and like, that's crazy. Like, if you think about that right now, that's insane. And like that, sure. that kind of stuff happened. And so that was definitely a moment for, for, for me. And, and the last thing I will say, you know, Jared, you and I kind of uh, went back and forth. We messaged back and forth about this. Like not only were we making copy copycats of the stuff that we made, but in every subsequent year you go to NAM, and I don't have anything against all of our like competitors or whatever. Every year we would go there and we would all, sort of chuckle at the fact that like all these other companies were the next year, they were doing the thing that we did, you know, the previous year, you know, it's like, you know, the very first time I ever went into John's office and said, we had just gotten this, this, um, vertex, this, this machine that cuts laminate and Max had just trained me to wrap drums. So I was wrapping a lot of the drums at that time when we got this machine. And the reason why we bought this machine is because you didn't have to cut um, glass sparkle by hand or formica by hand, which ruins your wrists, your thumbs, blades. Oh, yeah. It's, it's terrible. So this, this, um, Variax, Veritax, I don't remember, but that's, it's something like that. Jeremy has the machine, like the actual machine at Q. Yeah. Anyways. So I remember I went into John's office and I said, Hey, I said, I said, I have an idea. Do you mind if I pull a scrap, some scraps out of the dumpster and try an idea? He said, yeah, what's your idea? I said, how how narrow can I make the blade? How narrow can I make the cutter? And he goes, he goes, I don't know. He goes, if you go too narrow, it's just it's it's just going to rip the material apart. It's just going to chip it, and it's going to be not use not not usable. And he goes, but if you want to work with some scraps, he goes, you know, knock yourself out. And I was like, okay. And so I literally like grabbed scraps, and I just started to run this material through the machine. And it was just chewing it up and it was not working. But then I, I hit that sweet spot where I was at about like a half an inch. And I was like, hmm. And I ran it through and I had a nice clean strip. And I was like, oh, dude. 
So then I started to like sand the edges of that strip and I flipped everything over on, on a table. And then I just started to tape it together like we did with the red, white, and blue Travis kits. But the strips were just smaller, right? And so I did it with, and I was just like, hey, can I wrap uh, a drum in material that everybody hates? Like, just because we're not, you know, we're not going to do anything with it. He's like, yeah, sure. He goes, use the, you know, blue Canyon marble and black gloss. We got tons of black gloss for mica. So I wrapped this drum and I'll never forget, I wrapped it and Jeremy even um, measured it off, edged it, and we built it. And I walked it into John's office. And he was just like, oh my God. And I'll never forget that drum. And I have pictures of that drum because I owned it for a while. It was a 10 ply. It, it was a crappy shell, but black gloss, blue Kenyan marble, black gloss, blue Kenyan marble, black gloss. And, it, and with all silver, it was dope. And we took it to NAM that year. And that, hmm. little, that little experiment so well went so well that John was just like, well, what if we did that with this? And what if you did flat black and, you know, silver glass? And so we started to like, like invent stuff like that. And I, and like, literally you go to, I, I went to NAM four years ago and I was like, Ludwig, I was like, Oh, look, stripes. Like I was like, yeah. that's me. At the, like, and at the, at the end, after like, after I was gone and that's one thing I'm bummed that I missed the raps at the end of it were just like insane, which is like, everyone is doing like, Gretch had the one that had the, the little cutout in it. Yep. Or, you know, D drum had the one that had like the racing stripes. Yep. It's like, I know where that all came from. Yeah. I mean, that Finch kit, the black and red Finch kit for the She yep. Burns video. Like that was that. Yep. Alex walked in that day when I was farting around, like making strips or whatever. And he was, you know, you know. Or he's his, just his, his, cutting strips right, right. for no reason. <laughs> yeah. And Alex walked in and, you know, they're on a record label and his pupils were this big. And uh, he was just like <laughs> that, like, man, yeah. I, I want to throw it out there that like before, you know, like before we did this and after doing the first uh, interview with Jared and Mike Kelly, that like uh, I saw a couple comments of people just being like, wow, I remember Orange County drums. I just didn't know it was such a big deal who would be from the generation who was a little bit older. And you cannot blame them for that. They're they're right. like they just weren't that of that age. Right. And I think that. It just needs to be kind of if people listening right now are feeling that and kind of thinking, yeah, it was cool, whatever. But like if you were like, you know, like Jared and I are the same age. If you were, let's say, 10 to 12 years old to 30 something years old at that point uh, and kind of into that, this is like Travis Barker, Orange County. It was Ringo and Ludwig of that era. 100%. You know what I mean? It was like revolutionary yeah. it was kids dream kits i think i said that in the first episode yeah we, we, t- it, we said that in the first one like it was the equivalent of like nuts. seeing a radio king with with gene krupa that generation you see ringo totally ringo with the ludwig you see bonham behind a vista light you see alex van halen be- behind that monster and then you see travis or chad or even john otto coming out with this massive kit yeah i mean that sums it up right there it for our generation in, in that time there was nothing yeah. bigger once in a lifetime. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, once in a generation, I would say. Sure. And maybe if it happens again with another company and another drummer, it'll be something different. It won't be the same, just like this wasn't the same as the other previous, right. you know, trailblazers. Right. It's you you guys, what you said before, I think was actually really kind of like moving about not really understanding until you left. But I mean, that's just anything. That's life. Like you guys had an extremely cool job that only a handful of you could fit all those people in like one small room, yep. you know what I mean? Who have the experience that you guys yeah. had, which yep. is just incredible. Yeah. But I, I know that I've told Corey and I've told, you know, like some of the, like I've told Mike Kelly, um, like I'll have dreams that I'm like back at the orange County shop, but it's like, everything's like weird. It's like, it's been shut down, but we're going to like, you know, try to bring the custom shop back. And it's like me and like John and Corey. And we're like trying to figure out like, okay, you know, all right, we got to, we got to start with this. Like, okay, here's the shells. Like, let's, you know, let's bring this thing back. And I mean, that's a, it's a crazy thing for me that it's that big of a staple in my life that I literally dream about being back there. And it's like, I can remember the exact, what that shop smelled like. Oh yeah. You know, I know the details. I remember Corey outside, we had a room that just the router and the table saw that we cut shells in. <sighs> There was a room built in the back that was like soundproofed. It just had carpet on the outsides. And there was a phone right there. And so like sometimes you'd answer the phone and you'd kind of be stuck there for a while. It had like a 20-foot cord. And 
everyone would get bored and you would like draw shit on the wall. <laughs> Corey at some point was on the phone and he drew this little graphic that said eight plex of butt nuggets. And he drew it like literally right next to the phone. And so anytime you went to answer the phone that was outside of the router room, you stared at this little, and it was like, looked like an old school, like movie sign, like had the like <laughs> bubble around it. And like, you would just go answer the phone. Every time I just, I couldn't help but laugh. I'd see <laughs> eight plex of butt nuggets. And I'm like, <laughs> but that, that kind of stuff, like, I mean, it, it sticks with me. Like I said, I dream about That's that awesome. place. I miss it. Like it's, it's a, it's a, it was a time in my just, life. Uh, that. Kind of just answer my last question. It was uh, one of the last questions was like, what do you miss the most? But, uh, that's it's the eight flex right yeah. nuggets. I was gonna say it's butt <laughs> it's nuggets. Butt nuggets, yeah. Yeah. Butt nuggets. <laughs> well, and, and I'll, so I'll, I'll answer the what do you miss thing. You know, it's it's a little bit like you know, it, for anybody that's a sports fan, whenever they interview uh, a sports uh, an athlete after they retire and they ask them, you know, what is it that you miss, they always say the thing that I'm gonna say, which is I miss the camaraderie, I miss the guys, I miss the vibe, I miss you know, really genuinely all connecting, like having this thing in common, this common goal. And we all really clearly gave a hundred percent. Like we all really cared about what we were doing. And I think that the, the beauty in that is that we all held each other accountable. There was nobody there that sucked because we yeah, wouldn't no, let no anybody one was there ever suck. off their game. Nah. Yeah. And so I miss the guys. I miss, I miss the movement. I miss what we were creating because Although Nick and I probably didn't realize at the time, like the the really the long lasting impact, we did know during the time there that we were doing something really special, and it felt like that every day. That's awesome, great answer. And I think one of the last questions that I had uh, that a lot of people are curious is: uh, Do you guys actually own any Orange County drums or still play them? I do. So I've got this kit. This is a 13, 16, 18, 22. Uh, this was built for Chris Hornbrook from uh, Poison the Well. Um, I've nice. had a couple, like I said, when I worked there, I could not afford them. Where'd you, uh, where'd you get got, that 18 from? Uh, my friend, I've got a friend named Jared, actually, who has a crazy <laughs> line on, like, finding insane, like, <laughs> so I told Corey, you might know this story. There was a, there was a snare drum that we had that was sat on the rack forever. That was, uh, was, it was four vents, right? But the vents were under the tube lugs. Yeah. It had like long tube lugs on it. It was blue glass glitter and it was a 12 or 13. I think it was like seven or eight. I told Jared that like, that was the one snare drum. Like I always told John, like, I'm going to buy that. I'm going to buy that. And then like, finally someone else bought it. I lost out on it. Jared's like, yeah, I own that drum at one point. I could probably track it down. And I'm like, (laughs) So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Jared is my, and that's, I told him earlier that we were on the phone and I was like, you know, I was like, I'm so screwed up on dates. I'm probably going to refer to you like on a bunch, like a bunch of this stuff. I know that (laughs) I was there, but you obviously know way more about it than I do. Like for various reasons, I just don't remember things like I used to. Maybe it's old age. Maybe. (laughs) Uh, I still have two snare drums. So I have, um, I have a really weird affliction. I name all my snare drums. And so, um. Uh, so I have baby girl, which is the first snare drum I ever, um, you know, bought, paid for, made, blah, blah, blah. And that's the, um, five and a half by 13, 20 ply vented. That is the, um, platinum bird's eye with the high gloss on it with the black chrome, um, hoops and lugs. And, um, that's the first, that was one of the first drums I had seen where we had the badge made. And it has the OCDP logo and my name under it. It doesn't say Orange County Drums. It has my name. And wow. so I still have her. She's a sweetheart. Um, and then I have the gray satin stain um, 7 by uh, 13 30 ply 3 vent that I yanked out of the trash and paid for the um, I paid for the, the, the parts on. And uh, he is affectionately named the dude. And um, <laughs> he, he, he does abide, um, and he's badass. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, I got to say, this is just like, this is different in many ways, because first off, this is more people I've had on the show. 
uh, than, than at any other time. Um, it's like almost 11 o'clock at night here, so it's later than we usually do them, which is kind of fun. Uh, it's just really special to get people who were at Orange County um, and kind of follow up on that previous episode. So um, real quick, uh, let's start with Corey. First off, Corey, thanks for being here. Is there anywhere you want to direct people to like find you on social media and stuff like that? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me, man. It's been a blast talking about this stuff and reminiscing and uh, seeing all your for faces sure. and stuff. Um, yeah, uh, you can find me, my name on 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 Instagram and Twitter and stuff where you can go to CoreyManski.com. There's links to everything there and music and videos and all kinds of crazy cool stuff. Awesome. Awesome. And Nick, my friend, thank you for being here and sharing your story as well. Super cool to have you. Same question. Where do you want to, anywhere you want to direct people to keep up with what you're doing? Yeah. Thanks, Bart. Thanks for having us again, man. Uh, yeah. My personal Instagram is at dag nasty D A G N A S T E E. Um, I try to keep up on drum stuff over there. I also just started a coach company uh, this week uh, with my wife and my my good buddy Josh Kimmich. We're renting out tour buses out of Magnolia, Texas. Um, you can find us at um, Texona Touring on Instagram. And uh, yeah, rent awesome. a bus. I need the money. <laughs> Dude, if you rent a tour bus from someone listening to this show, then tell me, because that's a uh, pretty small world. <laughs> right. <laughs> that would be yeah, awesome. no, that, yeah, that'd be killer. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, dude, Jared, I think you did an awesome job kind of leading the episode and being prepared and getting questions from people. So uh, it was kind of different after 173 whatever episodes to take kind of the back seat. And uh, you did a very good job. So thank you, my friend. No, oh, thank you. Glad to do it, man. And again, why don't you tell people Ghost Note Percussion, all that good stuff where they can uh, find out what you're doing. Yeah, so um, uh, pretty much on Instagram is uh, the main go-to. It's uh, at Ghost Note underscore Percussion. Uh, there you'll see not just Orange County, but uh, a lot of restorations, rewraps, repairs, some things that I make. And then um, you can also find me on Facebook. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And if obviously from what Nick said before, if you guys need or, or are looking for Orange County drums, I mean... Jared is your dude. I mean, find him on social media and, and reach out to him. Um, and then last but not least, let's just I want to mention for people who heard the first episode, Mike Kelly has like created Kelly drums. Like he said, I'm, I remember he ended was like, I'm starting a drum company. He has like done it like he has bought all the machinery. He has like been producing drums. So uh, way to go, Mike. Um, I'll put the link in the description for that as well. Uh, I feel proud of him from, <laughs> you know, in no, that time yeah. starting. It's awesome. Yeah, he's a great dude and I'm happy for Mike's him. Mike's the dude. Yeah. yeah, they look awesome. Yeah. So, um, all right, these guys, it's been a long one, but they're going to hang out for another couple minutes and uh, give me a little bit more of their time. We're going to do a quick Patreon bonus episode, and we are going to talk about uh, some times where uh, it's kind of the classic Patreon bonus question of things didn't work out right, things got a little screwed up, and they learned from their mistakes and uh and we're better for it um so if you want to hear that go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast and uh check it out or go to drumhistorypodcast.com patreon link and uh you can hear it there so um on that note fellas thank you so much for spending the time here again jared you have killed it my friend you did a great job um this is awesome thank you guys thank you awesome. yeah. thanks Mark. thanks for having us man appreciate it